on The Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. I am your host, David Agronoff, author of Punk Rock Ghost Story and Goddamn Killing Machines. Uh, I have a special guest here today, an author that uh, I have to admit, this is my first time reading his work, so he's going to have to tell us about his back catalog a little bit more because I haven't read it yet. Um, but uh, Seb Dubinsky is the author of a new book that for those of you on YouTube will see my cool uh, trade paperback early ed uh, edition. I know it's coming out in hardcover from Stocking Horse Press, but um, I prefer paperbacks anyway, so I'm lucky that I got this one. Um, but anywho, uh, Seb, welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on board. I'm really, really excited to be here. Now, James is one of my favorite, uh, James Reich, the founder and publisher at uh, Stocking Horse Press is like, is one of my favorite arbiters of good taste. And so um, I admit I had not heard of your work before uh, Stocking Horse did this book. And now uh, uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna be reading more of your work, but uh, look, tell us a little bit about where you come from, where you grew up and what were your early influences uh, on writing, and we'll talk about that stuff before we get into this new book, Fragments of a Revolution, which I am a big fan of already. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm French. <laughs> Starts well. I'm French. I was born in Paris. Um, I lived in the States when I was a kid from uh, 66 to 68 because my father was teaching in the States at the time, and so English is almost my first language, actually. That's 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 a uh, funny thing. My um, My Book education is a mixture of French classics, of course, and, and French literature. And um, but when I was uh, 13 years old, I discovered Burroughs uh, in the in the bookshelves of my aunt, and uh, it was like one of the biggest shock. You know, I I read it, didn't understand it, and loved it. You know, it was like all these things together. You could read things you did not get, and and they, and yet they made sense. But I would say my biggest influence in writing actually is not writers it's music because i was a punk in the, in the late 70s and, and, and early 80s and um and art uh especially pop art or anything coming after pop art that was that i thought was very very interesting so i'm i'm i'm, I'm i am as much a, a visual and, and and a musical writer than a writer writer i would say uh, where, where were you in the States when you got into punk rock? Because the geography of punk rock is really important to me, like, because I know the scene, the punk rock scene you come from, especially pre-internet days, was very important to the local community that you came from. No, it, it, it came from France. And, and, and actually, originally, it came from London. I, I spent the, the, the London 1979 in um, the summer of 1979 in London. And my uh, friend's father's, my father's friend's, uh, house and he had a son who was my age and who was a punk so we went to free con went to free concerts and, and places and pubs and then i was 15 it was amazing and and uh I'm super so I was, jealous I was, <laughs> <laughs> yes i was there <laughs> I, was, I mean two years too late it's not sorry 77 but but it was still going on at the time and it really really you know like the hippies of the 60s who lived the whole thing you know these are things you don't move away from that much you know unless you betray yourself, which I haven't done so far. <clears throat> well, right, and, and uh, my favorite writer came out of late 70s punk rock too, which is John Shirley. Um, and, you know, his, the influence of that, that early pioneer days of punk rock, I think, because it's one, th like any punk rock late 70s, early 80s before like the internet and Nirvana kind of like, you know, made it okay for, for like the mainstream to like alternative music it was very different back then um yeah i have a whole novel themed on that but we're not talking about me today um but anyways yeah that 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 punk rock um influence you know it's funny because i didn't know that about you but now uh some of the um 
kind of narrative structure makes sense, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So, so how did you get uh, serious about writing yourself and what was your first serious piece of writing that you published? The first piece of writing I published was in 1994 in France. I mean, I have a double career, a French career and an American career. So the, the, French, and the French career started first in 1994 with uh, what was going to become the Babylon, the Babylonian trilogy later. The first volume uh, came out in France. And I was like uh, 34 at the time. Uh, but I want to be ser serious. So I was serious about 10 years before. I started really writing seriously 10 years before. And... Um, and things happened. Uh, I mean, actually, no, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm talking bullshit. 1994 was the first novel, which is not an English novel, The Parallel Lives of Nikolai Bakhmaltov, which is only in French. And then afterwards, the next, the following year was the, the, the book I translated from, from English. So but it, it took me 10 years to, to, to get published. Now, when you say parallel, do you, um, if you write something in French, have you ever translated or vice versa? Do you have any works that are in both languages or do you see those as completely separate? Well, Fragments of Revolution is a translation. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's from, good to know. From the French. <laughs> it was originally written in French. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And I, and I translated or rewrote, slightly rewrote it in English. Uh, mm -hmm. Translations are never perfect. So, so. Well, yeah, you got a, you got something up on, on most work that's been translated is you have the ability to do it yourself so there you <laughs> go <cheap>. yeah <laughs> well i've been really into um chinese science fiction lately and i know like on dickheads we did a whole episode on um, asian fiction and translation and the the process of translating is is very fascinating to me like uh, how it happens but yeah um, it's cool that you were able to do it yourself, but um, so you have cross pollinated with with your French to English career. So uh, that's cool. Um, but so the Babylon trilogy is the one that a lot of uh, my dickhead folks would probably be most interested in because it it sounds very Philip Dickian. It is was that an influence on that trilogy, or or are we? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I I I I would say. Dick has always not not style wise, but 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 story wise, and 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 I would say pessimism wise, the 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 the, the way he looks at states and and, and, and control and all these all these uh, identity uh, really influenced me. Uh, and I was reading a, a lot of uh, PKD, PKD and and Moorcock also the not 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 the not the fantasy stuff, but the Jerry Cornelius and and all these uh, all these series. So yes, Dick is an, is a huge. Uh, shadow over what i over what i do yeah yeah, yeah. and also what, what i like with dick and i mean i don't like to compare myself with dick because he's huge but but it's 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 he's huge dick it's, <laughs> he's, you can't <laughs> get away from those yeah yeah you have to say that at least once we're right? just over it over it our other podcast. Exactly. they will never get over it yeah. um but, but the thing the thing i like with him which i feel uh, uh close to him and it's also the same in Fragments of Revolution. It's always taking the, 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 the small man's point of view, the little man's point of view, mm -hmm. not, not the superhero type of, 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 of character, but the, uh, a grain of sand that realizes suddenly is a grain of sand and wants to do something about that or has to do something about it. Yeah, I know we just recently did um, our friends from Frolix 8 and there's a lot of talk about, he was really into, um, you know, making sure that his characters were flawed, <laughs> right? <laughs> that they were, they weren't heroic. That was like really important to to uh, Phil. But uh, yeah, so um, you know, this exp experimental type of prose, it's really interesting because you said uh, English is almost your your native language, and and I always wonder this when I'm talking to people that are fluent in multiple languages, is especially writers, is um, the tendency to think in one language or another and do you fall more into that in the process of, of writing a book in one language or the other you know what i'm saying like i think that's like really interesting to people who who only write in one language so i'm wondering about the process of of um choosing to write something in english and choosing to write something in french and like how uh that's different for you in the writing the two different languages 
Well, that's, it's, it's a very difficult question because you're, you're talking about the, the conscious and subconscious work at the same time. To me, it came oh, I actually rather... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to do strike novel. No, but the thing is that um, I would say it, the question uh, came later in the beginning of the, of, 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 of the year 2000 when I suddenly got published in America. Because suddenly I had two parallel lines, my French writing and my uh, Anglo-Saxon writing. And my Anglo-Saxon writing was around the city-states, so around the whole construction of, 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 uh, of Spanish fiction. And I realized I could only write this in English. So suddenly anything linked with this city-states world will, would be in English. And the other stories that should be in French would come in French immediately and would be outside of this. Of this, uh, but I don't know if that's a conscious or subconscious choice. It just happens. So that that leads me to to question. Since this book was written in French, do you think you could have written this one in English first, or did you kind of have to get it out in French first? That's a good. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It, yeah. I don't know because you know it's 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 very funny because. I mean, there's a whole story behind that book. And the thing is like, when I started writing it, I, I was in France, I lived in France. And I was published by, by, by this big uh, uh, publisher in, in France. So all the, um, the, the structure, uh, the outside structure uh, was in French, but it dealt with Mexico, it dealt in, and when I started the book, my idea was, which was in 1993, and I, and I, this I, one's uh, been kicking around for a while. You have yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's an old book, and and uh, and um, I started writing it. And my idea was, what would have happened if the Mexican Revolution had been filmed by CNN? That was my first. That was my first idea because CNN was a new thing at the time. And right. And um, so to, when I rewrote the book, when I translated the book later in English, it sounded like it was a natural language for the book too. That's that's very that's very rare for me that it fits so well in, within the two languages for, for different reasons. Right. And so one of the things that, so it's kind of experimental in format, not, not like super surreal, but it, it's not the way that you break up the book is you're you're playing with forms and and a lot of white spaces and 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 I don't mean this in a bad way I I liked it right and so what I'm wondering is is do you find it just as easy to experiment with prose in French as you do in English or do you do you experiment more in one or the other I, I I'm fascinated by the idea of writing in two different languages so. So you're the first person I've talked to who on this podcast who writes in more than one language. So sorry if there's a lot of questions on that. For me, I mean, to be honest, um, English is the experimental feel for me. English because, because. because of everything, because of boroughs, because of music, because of, 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 of the pop art cut-ups and transparencies. To me, English is a natural way of uh, uh, expressing uh, 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 opposite thoughts or, or things like that, or putting them together. Whereas French for me is much more um, uh, uh, subdued, uh, much more poetic, which is my problem, which is why I dropped French for a long time. I haven't written anything in French in, in many, many years because I feel more comfortable with English right now. Interesting, okay. Uh, more poetic language. It, well, it definitely sounds that way to me, <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Uh... And I'm lucky to live with somebody who speaks French and can tell me when stuff is badly translated when we watch French movies. So, um, which is which is a nice thing. Um, so you gave me a little bit of the history of the idea for a fragments of a revolution. So you said this goes back to the '90s. Like, what was your first interest in? We should let people know that this book is about the um, revolution in Mexico in 1969. And I admit. I know a little bit of the history of it, but uh, you know, as as Americans, you know, 1969 is the year of the Apollo landing, and one year after Summer of Love. So, um, and I know I've been thinking about 1969 because we just did the Philip K. Dick novels of 69, and 
we always go through the history of those years. And I admit, I did not mention the Mexican Revolution. So what sparked your interest in this particular time in history? Uh, it's, it's very complex. I try to make it short. I'm an anarchist. I mean, I'm a declared anarchist. So, so of course, anything that You're in has safe to... space here. Uh. <laughs> and 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 in anything. I mean, all the the, the history that is linked with anarchism is is, is always been a, a, a passion uh, uh, for me. Um, and I I I had read an article on, on a revolution that start that um, took place in 1910-1911, which was less known than the Pancho Villa and Zapata uh, figures, which were the Flores Magón brothers, who started uh, a, a revolution in Baja California and, and, and in the northern, I mean, exactly in the places where the, the, the book, I mean, all, all the events are real. I just moved them from 1910 to 1969, where you had another uprising, which was a student uprising in, in Mexico City and other places. And my interest was, like I said, to mix these uh, very important uh, uh, episodes with, at the time, what was doing at the time, we didn't have the internet as we had now, we have now, but it was the CNN thing, the 24-7 the, 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 the news with an American bias, which I thought was would, would be interesting. Hmm. Yeah, it's just, I, I'm, I'm somewhat interested, and in, I have books on the, the uh, 1910 anarchist revolution because in, in Mexico that I've never read but I bought them partially because at one point I thought it would be cool to write like a spaghetti Western about <laughs> that, that, um, that revolution. And I just, uh, it never went beyond like, Hey, I should buy a book about that. And maybe someday I'll write it. Uh, but it's a fun period. And I really, I, I, I skimmed through the books and I, so I know a tiny bit, but what I did not know was anything about, uh, the 1969. Right. And so, I don't know how much of this is fictionalized and how much of this is based on historical fact um, at all, but I really enjoyed just the story and the ideas of it. And we'll, we'll drill down more on it as we go on in this interview, but how much um, of this is based on historical fact? Well, what is based on historical facts from 1910 to 1911 are all the places and the fights that took place. Um, I followed closely the Flores Magón thing. The other, th the other thing also that is close to the historical fact is that the Flores Magón uprising was uh, a mixture of, of, um, of, of native uprising, of na native uh, Mexicans and European uh, anarchists. So it was a very motley crew that, 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 that went... What is true also, I mean, it's not directly, but it's also true that this revolution launched a lot of other revolutions. Zapata started its revolution from reading a manifesto by the, 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 the Flores Magón brothers. What is true of 1969, um, there's nothing direct, there's just allusions to, 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 to events. And, and also the, 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 the scene where you have the American tourists <laughs> coming to the, you know, all these things uh, are, 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 I have anecdotes from, from people about that. So, 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 so it's a mix. It's, it's, it's a real mix of, 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 of fiction and, 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 and reality. But to all, what, one thing is also, I have to add, I'm sorry to, 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 take, to take up space, but when I started no, I'm writing- here to, I'm here to listen to you and sorry. <laughs> but, Talk all but, you need. <laughs> out then. Go. <laughs> what 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 a very strange thing happened also while I was writing it is that the Chiapas uprising, the real the, the, the Zapatista uprising, started about six months after I had begun writing the book, and it was very strange for me. I stopped. I stopped writing for about four or five months because I could not see myself writing a fiction when real people died, when when, when there was a real struggle, and I felt like I didn't want to be a uh, a literary vampire feeding on the the so I, I really wait about yeah about eight months before things settle down or settle down more to 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 keep on writing because there was a incre incredible synchronicity in, <laughs> in the in the situation. Yeah. So uh, what happened with Chiapas was I, I mean it slowed you down, but the world really was paying attention to Mexican radicalism in a way that it really hadn't before 
Chiapas, and it became almost like a trendy. It, it was a. It was almost like a trendy thing to be like supportive of the state of Chiapas and sub commander Marcos and punk kids were wearing t-shirts and, you know, so, so how did that affect your, your ongoing process with the, with this story? Well, like I said before, and, 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 and it's a perfect question because when I said there's a scene in the book where you have uh, a moment where the, there was a city that's taken by the, 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 the revolutionaries and, and, and suddenly uh, uh, tourist buses full of American students arrive and they, and they get drunk and they, and they scream revolution, revolution in the street. That, <laughs> that is exactly what we were talking about. That's exactly how I felt. And this is how exactly how it influenced the, 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 the writing of the book. Yeah, for somebody who was already thinking about these issues and thinking about about Mexico, it, it just had to be really weird to, you know, I guess it's not that different from those of us who, you know, consider ourselves pioneers in punk rock. And then all of a sudden, you know, Nirvana comes and, and it's okay for the football players to, to like, <laughs> you know, but um, so yeah. We, we, at, at least we had mud honey. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we did have mud honey, <laughs> they, were, they were better. And I will argue that Soundgarden has great riffs, but uh, <laughs> but anyways, I, I'm not totally anti Seattle. I just want to be clear on that. Um, but there's a scene in this book where um, you know this woman asks at one point, like, "Are you going to execute us?" And um, is one of the I, I pointed it out in my book review because I thought it was one of the more powerful parts of the book, and because I think. I had a kind of an idea of where where you were coming from as as the book was starting, but to to talk about you know how this revolution wasn't going to be as violent as some people were afraid of, and that was an important part of the book. Can you tell us about that scene and and where you know what the inspiration was for that? Because to me, that was one of the more powerful parts of the book. Well, the the the, the uh, one thing for me that I mean. One of the messages of the book is, is about violence. It's about violence in, 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 in all directions, in all in all forms, and 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 there is the necessary violence and there is the unnecessary violence in, 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 in these ways. And actually that scene came from a poem by Raymond Carver. There's a poem by Raymond Carver about um, uh, Precisely the kind of same scene. There's a Pancho Villa comes to uh, Hacienda, and uh, uh, there's a beautiful woman who is married to this to to this to the owner, and they make fun of the owner, and in the end, uh, the owner is left alone in the garden while uh, Pancho Villa goes to bed with his wife, and the poem ends. Uh, Raymond Carver ends. This this poem is dedicated to this man. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it it, it, code, it echoed very much in, in me and in, in, in that thing that Lou, I will always be on the side of 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 of, of the human of, of of and I want this revolution to be on the side of the human because it deals with human dignity and if you lose your dog, human dignity or you let it uh, 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 go out of hand. I mean, you, you forget it in your in your in your political agenda. Then everything is done for nothing. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the kaleidoscopic uh, nature of the of the narrative, right? Because one of the things that's cool about this book is that, and I mean, it's in the title, "Fragments of a Revolution." <laughs> um, and I talked about earlier that the white space that you play with in this book, which is. The idea is, is that um, there's a sprawling epic version of this that is written Stephen King style with every detail about, you know, the dust landing on the windowsills as they, you know, gather to, to, to organize the students and do, to do this and that. That's not this book. Um, and I'm not saying that that would be Obviously, I'm not saying that that would be better. What I thought was cool about this book is, is that you leave some of the revolution to our imagination with those white spaces by, it's almost like we're getting pictures. Um, and like you said, now that I know that you've talked about this, the CNN influences, it seems like what you were trying to do was to almost be like, if you caught this newscast, 
this live report from here and this from here, that seems to be the motivation for that narrative structure. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, the thing is like, it's, it's uh, it, one thing when I, when, when I wrote it is I could not believe that fiction could not, would not take into account the MTV, CNN, the new formats of television, the new short clips, the, 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 the and, and um, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to recreate that thing, but once again, not to do it in a, in a Ballard or Burroughs style, because first, because I love them, and, and, and second, because uh, they're masters, but to do it through memory. Uh, mem we, we talk about flashes of memory. That's exactly what I'm doing <laughs> uh, in the book. It's, it's the, the hero, the narrator, Lorenzo, actually doesn't remember what you're reading until the end. And you, don't, you will never know if what he remembers is what you have read, because he can't remember. Oh, you, you got ahead of my questions a little bit. Oh, sorry. We'll go, we'll go back to it. <laughs> we'll come back to Lorenzo in a little bit, but, um, and what he remembers and what he doesn't remember. But we're, we're on the same page here. Um, well, let, let's go into Lorenzo. <laughs> we're there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that was awkward. Uh, so <laughs> Lorenzo ends up living in Europe as a, a lot of radicals who um, did stuff back in the day. Mm -hmm. His he's an unreliable narrator in the sense that he he doesn't re, he part of the fragmentation of the narrative is just based on his you know. It seems like he doesn't want to remember. A lot of it what's his motivation for not wanting to remember it's, for some people this would be like glory days you know like these are your glory days and you know he doesn't romanticize it um i think i know what the motivation is but from your perspective what was his motivation for not glorifying his this time of the revolution well, the, the thing is, like he is asked in the beginning to 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 for by German magazine to 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 write about this revolution has become mythical in in in, in uh, like all revolutions, and especially when they fail. <laughs> As an anarchist, we have a list. <laughs> we have a list of these, and his motivation. I mean, his his problem is that he does not remember, and he doesn't remember because it's a failure. And his friends died, and and uh, and and the repressed memories do not come from a choice, but from trauma. And he has to come to terms with this trauma because of his son, in order to over overtake it, to overwin it. And uh, it's not obvious. Yeah, I well, yeah, the trauma and well, anarchists have a lot of those traumas from those near attempts from Spain and Mexico and so on but uh but, but you know protest fiction uh as it were is a time where we get to kind of um relive or rewrite the history and kind of you know put forward our ideas in a way where uh we can make it a, a, a brighter outcome. But of course here you, you know, you're talking about those feelings, you're processing those feelings for Lorenzo. And was there any thought or idea of, of rewriting the history of, at all? Or, because that's where I think science fiction is, is good for. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is why I write speculative fiction. <laughs> On the other side, in order to, 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 to try to, to, to not rewrite history, but uh, maybe uh, give it another echo. Uh, uh, but when I worked with Fragment of Revolution, no, I knew I knew it had to be a, 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 a it wasn't going to be a tragic history. Uh, but I want to present it. I mean, you, you mentioned spaghetti western in the beginning. I wanted to, to do a spaghetti western aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, uh, with various serious underlining motives at, at the same time. Um, That's something that I liked about this book too. Is that um, 
And while I mentioned that there, there could be an epic version that would have all those details, is I was filling in a lot of those gaps on my own by, you know, and 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 that was kind of that was kind of a fun thing is I think that the motifs are there, like the ingredients are there in this book. And that's one of the things that I think is really neat about it. And um and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this book and wanted to do this is because um I really had fun reading this is is a short it's a quick read it's um but it's really jam-packed full of ideas and you know um that, yeah yeah I just think it's fun and so it had to be cool for you too because you uh, you're reviving and re translating this idea that you had you know and work with a lot earlier and that came from um specifically thinking that this was a book that James Reich at Stocking Horse would like. Can you tell us how that happened? I know I talked a lot there and there might be a lot for you to process, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, I knew Stocking Horse because of my friendship with Defoy, who has published uh, 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 two books there. Um, and I always loved James as a writer. I, I really, really, I think he's one of the best writers in America right now. I really, really, really amazing. I love songs My Enemies Sing. Is, me too, me too. I mean, it's, 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 it's but I also love, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but I also love the soft, uh, uh, what I call soft invasions, which I thought was, 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 I was absolutely kind of fine. And, one too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean it's, it's prose I feel comfortable with. Uh, I mean, it's not. I know it's not the intention, but for yeah. me, I feel I feel comfortable with these kind of things, and and so and so we got to know each other a little bit better. We 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 chatted on 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 on, on email, exchange emails, stuff like that. And like I said, I I, I read one of his uh, essays on on Chiapas, on, on on precisely that, on on the on, on the fact that uh, on the misunderstanding around the Zapatista revolution and and all these things, even in Mexico. And I, and I had forgotten, actually, I had this translation of Fragments of Revolution lying around. And I thought, you know, why not? Why, why you know, so I wrote him and I said, you know, would you be interested in, in, in reading it? And he was very polite. He said, yes. <laughs> and that happened uh, that way. So, 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 but in a way, it's weird. It's like to be there, to be at Stalking Horse with that book is like a natural way it's, it's it's interesting for me it's like it's a, it's a flow it doesn't matter if it, if if it took 20 years or 30 years wow man i'm getting old to for it to, <laughs> to happen it it it, uh, it had to be there yeah and sometimes a book like uh you know authors and i have to tell myself this sometimes too because sometimes you can sit on a book for a really 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 long time but it's okay if you end up with the right home because I, I'd imagine James being the editor and publisher of this had an effect that working with anybody else would have, you know, been a totally different book. And, and you know, sometimes the power of waiting is, is one of the best things you can do. And, and it sounds like with this book, that was the case. Um, I don't know. Am I reading too much into that, or <laughs> no, no, no? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's I'm I'm not a. I mean, it's it's probably the. I mean, I love Taoist philosophy. So 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 you know, when there's an obstacle, you just wait. <laughs> you know, it's it's not the time. It's not the thing. So 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 I have a very few, but I have a few books like that that are like in midair. Um, and I'm waiting for the time for them to to to, to find their, their 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 space. I'm not going to force it. And there, it really happened very naturally. So, so, so it was perfect. Yeah, I got to get better at at practicing that patience. <laughs> um, <laughs> it takes a lot of discipline. <laughs> well, you know, for me, uh, in the last couple of years, um, for a while there, it was very important for me. I made sure that I had a book every year that I was putting one out. And the last two years, I, I haven't because I've been waiting very patiently to find the right home for. Pretty much the last three that I've written, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and it took me a little while to be like, you know, develop other projects, do other things, 
um, but wait for the right time and the right person to, to do the books. And it can be, I, I can say with this one, it really seems like that was the right idea. But, you know, that's just me from the outside, knowing um, this book and knowing James and respecting his work. But um, so, um, so you do write speculative fiction and there is an anarchist tradition of, of speculative fiction. Probably the most famous voices are Ursula Le Guin and Norman Spinrad are very outspoken about being anarchist and writing anarchist fiction. And uh, it took Norman Spinrad to write uh, an anarchist far future book with a FTL drive that's run by orgasms. But, you know, uh, <laughs> And, Not there yet. <laughs> and he is an expat now living in France. So you have a French connection to there um, with, with that history. But this idea of radical fiction, and, and I like that on the book, it's, it's categorized as revolutionary fiction, right? And so who do you, is there, it's funny because I, I don't think you write revolutionary fiction with necessarily thinking about who the audience is, but like I have a friend who is a librarian who focuses on Latin American labor history and he's he's an anarchist and a radical. And so like, I almost put this in the mail to him after I finished it. <laughs> and uh, I think that there's tar target audiences and and actually, honestly, I thought about sending him this book and holding off this interview until he could do it with me because I knew he would do a better job of the interview than me. Um, shout out to my boy F and Dave. But uh, anyways, like this book, like what do you, who do you think is the, who's the target audience for this book? Or did you never really think about that when, when, when you were writing it? Were you just like, this is the story I want to tell and I got to get it out? Well, the thing is, like, it's, it's it's a very it's a very difficult question, and I think it's 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 a question that's impossible to answer honestly, because it's like asking a painter or a musician, "Who are you making music for? Or who are you painting for?" Uh, it's 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 we will always lie, <laughs> you know. If we say, "Ah, if it's for people, a specific group of people." Yeah, but also for everybody, if it's possible. But if we say it's for everybody, then we say, ah, yeah, but uh, you know. So, 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 so I would say for it, you know, it's it's my my, my ideal audience are people who are gonna get the the irony, the humor, the 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 the, the hidden aspects of the book because it's there's a lot of irony, or self irony, also in in, in 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 the book. So I guess it's it's, it's that kind of audience, ideal audience I'm, I'm writing for. The, the ones we get will get the, the the seriousness, but also the uh, the punk the punkness of it. And uh... mm -hmm. yeah, no, I mean, and I think it's there. I think this is this is this is protest fiction. It's the the book is is um, is radical uh, in a way that I think. <laughs> You know, some readers are going to, some of it's going to go over their heads. I know so, a lot of it went over my head and I admittedly, because I don't know the history of it. And there's a part of me that, you know, I think that's okay to under, to, to read something and understand that there's a little bit more under the water of this iceberg. Um, and I think some people read a book and then think like, well, if they didn't get it, that hurts their enjoyment. Whereas I don't look at it that way. I look at it as like, well, maybe then I'll be able to pick it up another time and get it better. Or maybe I'll watch a documentary a couple of years from now and I'll go, oh yeah, that reminds me of that book that I read. And I think there's many ways to enjoy a book like this. And, um, but for the listeners that are into radical fiction, you know, I, I really want to recommend Fragments of of a revolution is as a fun is is a stealth fun read because um well there's some heavy topics and there's you know obviously a lead character that's dealing with some some guilt there's there's uh there's a lot of really cool stuff along the way and it's a it's a great book and um and 
and for, it's not long either, so it won't take you long to read. So, um, <laughs> but uh, on that note, uh, what else um, have you have you written that um, my listeners can get into? I know next I'm going to be reading the Babylon trilogy because it's sci-fi and that's it's on my radar and you were kind enough to send me an e-copy but i i hate reading on computers so i'm i that was very kind of you but i'm gonna buy it so you know um because i want it on the shelf too and maybe perhaps i'll uh i'll have you back because i can do what i want and i don't have to do a book that's new every time right so what else what else can uh you besides fragments that that you can point my listeners to if, if, if we're if we're going to the the revolutionary uh, uh aspects uh, i would say there are three three books the son, the son of synth uh I, I mean of course the, the the trilogy would be would be also a good introduction but three more would be uh, the song of synth which deals with uh, uh, uh government control and and, and 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 cctv and all these things uh, Missing Signal, which is about fake news. I mean, it's, it's very weird because I, I wrote it before Donald Trump used it, but it's about a guy who uh, uh, writes fake UFO uh, 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 stories for the government. <laughs> okay, and, and, and the third one, which is uh, uh, The Invisible, which is a noir uh, taking place also in the city states. Uh, about um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you like democracy, the notion of democracy and the notion of control, also. So we say, yeah, I would say in the Song of Synth, Missing Signal, and the Invisible would be a good introduction to, to my work. I mean, all my works are connected. I mean, there are, you have characters coming from one story to another, but you can read them in any order. It doesn't matter. Okay, so there's a Dubinsky. Uh, uh, EU expanded universe, like that it at all. Yeah, together. yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so eventually we're gonna find you at the dark tower at the end. So uh, <laughs> I, I sure hope not. Time for anyone who hasn't read the dark tower, but um, hey, you've had plenty of time to read that by now. Um, I'm not suggesting you have to do that, but. <laughs> but um, the straight up uh, spaghetti western version of this, um, I'm I'm telling you, I'm not against that. Um, but you you doing it before me, uh, because you would obviously be more. Um, uh, you wouldn't have to do any more research before writing it. So um, you got it. Uh, but yo, uh, fragments uh, of a revolution uh, for the YouTubers. I'm holding it up. Um, this is out from Stocking Horse Press and uh, for, for it, pretty much anything on Stocking Horse Press, um, I'm going to recommend. It's a, a press that you should be following and reading. Um, I discovered it through Duncan Barlow because I, I knew Duncan through punk rock circles uh, growing up and that's how I first discovered Stocking Horse. And then eventually uh, James came on uh, Dickheads to talk about uh, Maltzburg, uh, our shared love of Barry Maltzberg. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm excited to read your science fiction, um, Seb. This is, uh, but it was a good introduction. I'm glad to, to start with this one. Um, is there anything else that you uh, want to get off your chest to the to podcast land? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, and and uh, never trust your neighbor. Well, yeah, and I didn't, well, you know, we sign off on dickheads with Stay Paranoid, but um, but it's funny because uh, I, I think it's awesome that you did a, a novel about the CTV thing. I just recently read that we have been harmonized about about China, and it was, it was very strange to see specifically things that Dick wrote about in The Man Who Japed in the 50s, right, <laughs> about social control and those kinds of yeah. things. And so um, one of the fun things to do uh, will be, we can come back and do another interview in a couple of years and, and, and really dig into how much um, between missing signals and, and, and your sense stuff that, how much you got right. 
So, because um, we. Well, you will see. You will see with the Batman trilogy. I wrote it during the first Iraq War. Mm hmm. Okay. So. <laughs> you know, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And like I say, it took, it took an Iraq war, two Iraqi wars, and the economic crisis of two thousand nine to get myself to get it published in the states. <laughs> so, then people were like, "Hey, yeah, yeah, so many people got it." <laughs> well, it's crazy to see the science fiction that that got things right and didn't get things right, and um, I still think um, John Bruner talking about mass shootings in Stan and Zanzibar in nineteen sixty nine has got to be. One of the creepiest, um, like, seeing things ahead ahead of the curve. But, uh, anyways, that's the fun of speculative fiction. Seb, um, uh, it was great to talk to you about uh, fragments of a revolution. I hope we can send lots of readers uh, to this book. And um, thank you for joining me on Postcards from a Dying World. Thank you very very much. It's coming out on May fifth, Cinco de Mayo. Ah, perfect timing. All right, so uh, uh, pick it up, Stocking Horse Press, hardcover, uh, get it while you can.